ever had uh, your crew get involved with any of the uh, contestants? Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, not to the extent of the Romanian or the Russian. Uh, <laughs> but a couple seasons ago on uh, Jake Pavelka's season, which was subtitled On the Wings of Love. But we had a producer have an affair with one of the girls on the show. When you're when you're working on a show, when you're making a show, do you do you can call controversy and like to create that kind of off-screen buzz because something crazy has happened? Is that part of the development process? Is that part of oh, the, yeah. the thing? Well, certainly in the early days uh, when I was doing a lot of shows for Fox and I was working with my friend Mike Darnell, um, we would sit there and try to think of crazy ideas and we would try to warm up each other and then and then. Whenever we thought we had something that could be produced into a television show, we'd always say, well, can we really put that on television? And then when we would say that, we said, now we have to put it on television. Because <laughs> if it was questionable about whether or not it was appropriate for viewers, then we knew it had a chance to, to be a success. The, the one that always uh, sticks in my mind is uh, a show of yours, Breaking the Magician's Code. Yeah. And I, I kind of wonder whether you've got like an army of... Uh, Angry magicians following your oh, yeah, that was really a big deal. I, mean, I don't know if anyone remembers that show. That, that was a show we made uh, like in '96 or '97. I'm not sure what year it was, but it was really simple. We would have them, you know, because it was back when like David Copperfield and all those guys were doing all those magic shows and specials, and and uh, and basically we would do that show, and then the twist was that we would then show how they did the tricks, and and we had a magician who was willing to break the magician's code and he wore a mask and we paid him $150,000 to do it and um, and it was crazy because that, that show was a, at the time was the highest rated show in the history of the Fox network and um, the magicians went crazy on us. They sued <laughs> us and they, threat, they death threats to me and Darnell and the masked magician had to go into hiding and they figured out who he was, they knew who he was. And, and so his, he, he never worked again, I don't think, as a magician, <laughs> which is so sort of sad. But like, there's, a, there's a place in Los Angeles called Magic Castle, which I've been banned for life from. And, 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 and they have really good uh, chicken skewers, so I miss that. But, uh, um, it, it was crazy. But the, the, the funny thing about that is like, they sued us for, like, for ruining their business and whatever. But like, you could buy books at any magic store that told you how to do those tricks. So it was like... It's a ridiculous claim. The, the magic isn't that strong. You're still going, yeah. right? It's all, it's all fake. Um, so, if, if who wants to marry a multi-millionaire? Was it 2000? That paved the way for The Bachelor, which started on ABC in 2002, I think. It feels more 2002, yes. Yeah. Okay, should we, should we take a look at a clip of the show? We've got some, uh, some interesting things to look at, I think. We'll run the BT. Oh man. For your Emmy consideration. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, another, that was a great clip. I've got another question um, about casting. Now you're in season 16. People know the show. It's kind of a, it's a staple of, of the ABC fixtures. It's launched around the world in kind of local versions. Does that make casting more of a challenge in that the, the people who want to be on this may be using it as a stepping stone for immediate career? Do you struggle to find kind of real people with real stories? Well, sincerity uh, and you know, being there is in the show for the right reasons is really important to, this, to the integrity of the program. If people don't think that any of the participants are there to try to actually make a lasting relationship, then I think the show would crumble. But I think, you know, so we're always, you know, having to weed out people who are there to promote something in their life or trying to be famous or trying to get on Dancing with the Stars or whatever. Um, but I think the casting 
it's easier to cast now than it was back in the day because I mean, when we started doing these shows, nobody wanted to do reality shows. It was like, what? I'm going to make out with this guy and get in a hot tub on camera? You, know, like, you couldn't talk people into it. And now the, the people who are on the show are you know, they're mostly in their 20s, and, and these kinds of shows have been on for more than a decade. And so they've grown up with this kind of stuff, and they're used to it, and they and they're, they're, they're glad to do it. They don't, there's no stigma attached to it for these people now. I mean, really, when we started doing reality shows for prime time in the 90s, we couldn't even, we couldn't get people to go on them. We couldn't even book hosts. I mean, we couldn't, you would have to really work hard to get a host who would be willing to do it. Like, I remember the only guy who was sort of readily available was a really sweet guy named Richard Carn. He was uh, Tim Allen's sidekick at Home Improvement. He didn't. He didn't have a problem with it. So we would. Richard Carr hosted a bunch of shows for us, uh, but it was really impossible. And I mean, like so many shows that are enduring, and popular, some really good shows, it looks. It's quite a simple concept in some in some respects. What's the? I mean, what, what do you think? What's the, the secret sauce? What's the secret to its success and its longevity? Because not many reality shows carry on with that. Well, there's been a million bachelor ripoff shows. You know, there's been dwarves and guys with masks and oh. all kinds of guys who wasn't very good looking. Or, I mean, it's like some fat people. You know, it's like it's, there's been a million incarnations of that one concept of a single person and, you know, 25 suitors. Um, but I think the reason our show has survived, well, there's two reasons. First, we were the first, and so there's, there's loyalty from the audience. You know, they appreciate the original. You know, just like American Idol, you know, is, is sort of withstanding the charge from X Factor and The Voice, and Idol still is the dominant show of that ilk. Um, but I think the reason our show, one of the, the other reason why our show is, is still successful is that we really work hard to tell a sincere story. We really, when we cast for sincerity, we let the relationships actually go in the direction that they want. We don't force the bachelor or bachelorette to, to make decisions on who to keep or who to send home. And we spend a lot of time in shooting the show. I mean, our show, we shoot for more than two months to make one season of The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Some of the ripoff shows shoot in two weeks or three weeks. And so, you know, it's not like two months is a long time to form real emotional connections, but it's a, it's a lot you know, more likely than if you're trying to do it in two or three weeks. You mentioned, um, <clears throat> you mentioned that there have been a lot of other shows, <clears throat> politely, you could say, inspired by, right. otherwise you could just say copycats. Does that, does that irk you? Is that something that kind of gets under your skin, or you, is it, <clears throat> in another way, is it well, almost a form of flattery? I mean, no, I never saw this letter. It pissed me off. It's yeah. a chip away. Uh, well, because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of over it now, to, many sessions of therapy, and, <laughs> uh, but initially I was very upset because when I pitched the show to Andrea Wong at ABC and Bob Iger, who was there at the time, and Lloyd Braun, um, it took me an hour to explain how to do it, and uh, you know how they would date, and where they would live, and how they would be eliminated, and what would happen afterward, and how they would cover these things, I mean, it literally, they were, there was nothing like it, so it, it took the pitch was a full hour, and I usually don't like the pitch very long. I usually like to do five or eight minute pitches. But this took a full hour because it was, you know, it was actually an original concept. Um, so they had a lot of questions, and it was confusing to them at times. Um, now people come in and they say, "Oh, Brett Michaels is the Bachelor. What do you think?" I mean, that's not really creative. I mean, if a pitch that initially took an hour can now be boiled down to you know eight words. You know, I don't feel like those creative people are really doing their work, you know. You, you've produced a, a ton of reality shows. Is there, are, are any of those kind of inspired by other shows? Can you even see as a producer that you might want to take elements from popular culture or other things that, you know, you're, you're impressed by? Well, um, I mean, I made a show, my favorite, my, I have two favorite shows. My, my, one of them was Are You Hot? The Search for America's Sexiest People. Never made it to Canada, There's because there's sexy people here too, though. that's a shame. Um, but, uh, and uh, Superstar USA. And both those shows were inspired by, you know, the 
American Idol, uh, in, in a sense. Uh, Artie Hot was American Idol without the singing, so we just wanted to have people come up and be, you know, critique them how they look, and that's it. That's how that worked. And then uh, Superstar USA was a spoof on American Idol, where we had the same, essentially the same format, but we would get rid of the good singers and tell the terrible singers that they were excellent and they were going to be huge stars. And it, was a, it was sort of, you know, we were playing off the uh, delusion on the part of uh, uh, the less talented. So. And then now, with, with 16 seasons of, of The Bachelor, I think it's 16, um, but what have been, what are kind of the, the moments that stand out for you as the absolute highs and, and also the absolute lows, the most challenging times? Well, you know, when the show's going well, we always see the TV gods are smiling upon us because things happen on the show that you couldn't possibly have orchestrated or even written if you're trying to write this stuff. It's like when, you know, I don't know if anyone remembers Jason Mesnick's season when he picked uh, Melissa and then uh, they were all happy and he brought his little son and they were like one big happy family and then like 48 hours later he was having uh, flashbacks to uh, I think a sexual encounter with uh, Molly, and he realized that he was really in love with Molly, and, uh, and so he he asked, he called in tears and talked to us and said, "Is it okay to snitch?" And I'm like, "Well, it's your life, dude. It's like it's, we're not gonna tell you. You can't legislate that you must stay with this." So, but that was amazing TV because then we went into the studio and we shot, you know, the, the special that we call After the Final Rose which is normally shot in front of a studio audience and stuff and, and you know, I made the decision that there would be no music and no audience so it was just the most awkward situation <laughs> possible. It's literally a room like this, but completely empty so when, like, when Melissa had to walk out and sit next to Jason, or Jason had to walk out and sit next to Melissa, I forgot how it was orchestrated, but you literally, literally heard <laughs> And then just like dead silence and he had to sit there and tell her, hey, he was going to switch girls, you know. So like that stuff, <laughs> that's the stuff that really makes my life worth it. <laughs> There's no way to really come at that when you're trying to produce a show about finding a, a, a life partner, about making real emotional uh, romantic connections. So when the guy's, you know, disengaged from night one, you're sort of screwed and then you go to like, grind it out for the next eight weeks and then go into the edit bay and try to make it seem like you cared and it's, it's an unpleasant experience. So we've had, I would say, three, maybe four of the 16 bachelors fall into that category. Should we name them? No, I, I'm, I'm legally bound from naming one of them because uh, he sued me. <laughs> Trying to do with physical violence. <laughs> but, uh, that's, that was long ago. Moving swiftly on. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you talked about some of the some of the, kind of the interesting stories that have been that have come out through through the seasons of the show. I mean, I think now reality TV is kind of so embedded in the public consciousness. There's, there's also a degree of cynicism, and I think viewers are sometimes wary or you know the cynical that perhaps the stories are kind of preset and managed, or uh, that everything isn't, isn't real. Can you, know, can you relay those fears? Yeah, well, no, I can't relay those fears, because I think most of the shows are fake, you know. I think there's all kinds of bullshit going on behind the scenes with, I would say, outside of the talent shows, which are pure, <coughs> And The Bachelor, which is really, we really kill ourselves and spend a lot of money and time and destroy our staff to make sure that it's real. I think, I think, I would say 70 to 80 percent of the other show, other reality shows on TV are, are bullshit. They're, they're scripted, they're loosely scripted, they're, you know, uh, things are planted, like I'm not, I, I don't want to talk about shows in general, but like, <coughs> things are salted in to the environment so that things seem more shocking and bigger. Um, I mean, I think the weight loss shows are legit, you know, but a lot of, a lot of the TV out there is, you know, not completely fake, but the, the, the best moments 
of those shows are usually orchestrated. You pr producers now is now kind of the scripted reality genre where it's kind of out there in the open that, that these situations are very heavily constructed. There's a lot of suggestion given as to what to say and a lot of prompts. Is, is that kind of natural evolution of, of the reality TV genre? Is that always where it was headed? Well, there's, you know, I mean, as the viewer gets desensitized to these, you know, reality TV moments, then, yeah, the, 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 you know, the stakes have to increase, and so that forces the producer to try to, to, to deliver something that's even higher octane. But it's really, I mean, some of the blame goes to the producers, but some of the blame goes to the audience, because the audience is tolerating this. They're not requiring, you know, pure delivery of non-fiction content. They're, they're, they know it's, it's, uh, it's somewhat faked, and they're okay with it, which, is, which means that no harm, no foul. It's all, it's all just entertainment, so, you know. But when you call it reality TV, then I think they're, you're sort of, you're obligated to deliver something that is based in reality. If you call it alternative television, which I prefer, because I think that's really what it is, uh, um, then, you know, all bets are off. Do you think that uh, a long-running reality <coughs> format has to has to evolve over time to kind of to maintain interest? Is, is the Bachelor format, if you tweaked it, is each each season do you kind of think about slight changes you could make, or is it kind of doing well? So, you know, it's not broke, so I don't think it. Well, the cast is different every year, so people bring you know when the show is about people then you don't really have to monkey with the format so much because the people are individuals and they relate to things differently than the past the year before, the year before that. And I think that's what keeps it fresh year to year is the, the fact that the, the cast is different, you know, by definition. And, you know, we've, we've done other little things like we travel a lot now, we go around the world. You know, we used to shoot, you know, if we did 10 episodes, we would do six or seven episodes in Los Angeles and then we would, or you know, on the West Coast and then we would get on the road for hometowns and then finish it out on the, you know, in exotic locations. Um, but now we, we shoot two or three episodes in Los Angeles and then we get on the road. Uh, and this season of The Bachelorette that's airing right now in the United States, uh, we didn't shoot anything in LA. We, we, it was, Emily Maynard is the bachelorette, and she's from Charlotte, and she has a little daughter named Ricky. So we wanted to like, try to preserve that family element. So we shot the, the, the first three or four episodes in North Carolina, and then we went on the road. When a show, or you know, when these shows have become this established, is there a, a temptation to play it safe and, and steer away from controversy because you've got a bankable hit? <coughs> Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I think we're, you know, we've been guilty of that in the past. You know, uh, you know, the show seems to be doing well, and the cast is providing us with those unexpected moments. You know, the TV guys are smiling upon us, and and so, and so therefore you sort of go, well, let's just let it do its thing. And uh, and sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes you have a season that's kind of soft and, and not as exciting. Like I thought. The last season of The Bachelor with Ben was kind of a soft season. I didn't think it had enough twists and turns, and I didn't think there was enough memorable moments. You know, Courtney uh, was, was uh, a good character for us, and thank God for her. <laughs> but, uh, but other than that, there really wasn't much to hang our head on. Do, do reality shows have a, by definition, have a, a life cycle? I mean, can something like The Bachelor could be sitting here for 10 years and it's still running? Well, I don't know. I mean, I was speaking to one of my good friends at ABC who works in scheduling, a very smart guy, uh, and he said that he thought the show could stand for a lot, a lot longer um, still because uh, he, he said it sort of has replaced the soap opera. You know, and when you think about, you know, General Hospital and, and One Life to Live and those great daytime dramas, they were on, I mean, I think they're still on, yeah? I mean, it's like, it's like 100 years they've been on television. 120 years. Uh, 
25 years ago. It's <laughs> just after the Civil War. You mentioned the, the Bachelorette, and there's the Bachelor Pad as well. I mean, it's a franchise. Is, is there is there room to kind of use the, the core show and that that core idea to spin off spin off other ideas? Is, can you push it in different directions? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think Jersey Shore's done a good job of that. You know, they have their core show, and then, you know, I, mean, I think you know, I don't know who they are, but a lot of those cast members have gone out to have their own show, and I think they're doing well. So, is that something that you're you're actively looking at, kind of particular? I mean, we've menus? talked about it. I, you know, I'm also a little afraid of overexposure. You know, that we're doing 64 or 66 hours of bachelor-related things for ABC every year now, that's a lot, you know, and uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know how much more I want to do. And, you know, a band this week, people have been talking about the TV business and, and how it relates to kind of digital content and social media and so forth, that's always kind of a, a hot topic nowadays. I mean, do you, do you kind of harness social media to push the show? Do you, do you tune in or is that just too many voices? No, I, I look at uh, Twitter and, and uh, chat boards and stuff like that, but like we were talking about this earlier, series, um, there's a danger in doing that because you know, when a show like The Bachelor is working, it's, you know, there's 10 million people, 12 million people watching. But the number of people who are on those Twitter feeds or chat rooms, I mean, it's, it's a couple hundred thousand. So if you listen to just those voices, you might not be getting a clear representation of the audience as a whole. Because those people who are motivated enough to go on Twitter and go into the chat rooms and, you know, and, and dialogue with each other, they might relate to the program in a different way than, than, the, than the audience as a whole. So you have to, I mean, I, I look at those things, I do read them and I take suggestions, you know, but I don't look at it as gospel. I, I try to integrate it into the overall, you know, picture of feedback that I get from market research and, the, you know, the minute by minute ratings analysis and and then just my own gut instinct. So you, but you do listen. I mean, are there, are there any are there any examples? I think there's an example with, with the Twitter fans or kind of the online kind of super fans on the Bachelor pad. Album, but yeah, I mean, you know, I was sort of new to the Twitter scene, and uh, uh, and I was I was encountering some people. They they knew way more about the show than I do, and. And they were so into it, they loved it so much, and, and, and so we just we decided that this on this season of the Bachelor Pad we would have, I think we selected six super fans to come in and be part of the show, and I think that's going to be interesting because I think they're going to try to hook up with their favorite bachelors and bachelorettes. <laughs> that'll, that'll, that'll be fun to watch. We started filming that show last night, and uh, I heard it went really well. You shouldn't be here, should you? I know. I was um, double booked. And with all of the kind of the Bachelor shows. Kind of all those plates that you're spinning. I mean, have you have you even got any time to think about other other reality shows that you'd like to make? Does your production company kind of have a development team, or you just lock down? Yeah, we're going to do a couple of cable series this year. Um, and you know, for me personally, you know, I haven't done so many network primetime reality shows. It's I'm really. I mean, I, I just want to care about the show. Like, I won't do a show just to do a show anymore. I, I want to really think it's something that I would be interested in putting my best efforts into. Because I've made some shows that I didn't care about, and that's not a fun thing, and the, the, the product suffers. Um, so if I have an idea that I really think is good and new and somewhat innovative, then I'll try to do it. But uh, those are hard to think of now because there's so many shows, you know, there's, there's, you know, when we started doing this, it was all sort of new, um, but now there's, you know, I don't know how many reality shows there have been on American television in the last 10 years, maybe a thousand. And then the cable shows, the, is, is what you can do on cable different in terms of yeah, network TV? Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, you can go for a, a smaller niche, you know, I mean, the broadcast, you know, television is makes thinking of original reality shows, you know, that much harder. I mean, if you 
look at what's going on with network reality TV, there isn't really much innovation, you know. I mean, there's a lot of derivation, and, uh, but nothing, I mean, like, what's the last real sort of breakout original show? I mean, I don't even know. It's been years. And the, the, the I guess Undercover Boss was, a, was an original idea. In the, in the UK. Oh, really? Some the UK. Can't take credit for it. Can you tell us anything about the cable shows? What, what type of, I'm sure you can't say which, which cable next they'll be on, but what type, what areas they might explore? What one's, the about, are? one's about nerds. And uh, it's a docu so, you know, so. Uh, and uh, one's about, you know, people's obsessions. And so, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's nothing earth shattering. They're just, I mean, they're just like twists on stuff that, you know, you've probably have already been on the air, you know. It, but produced, hopefully, well, you know, so they're good. Back to network TV, Paul Lee, the ABC boss, gave the king um, a couple of days back, and he was saying it's a golden age of TV drama. Comedy is back after, you know, yeah. Fallon period, but. The, kind of the third leg of the, the stall is reality, and that is, you know, it's kind of a challenging time. And the, he was talking about the kind of the shock of the new and the lack of new ideas kind of coming through with new shows. Do you, do you buy into that? Totally. That's, I mean, that's a, that's a, it's a massive problem for everyone in, in that business because, I mean, you just look at the shows that come on the air and they just, they just, they just don't work. You know, I mean, the duets show, I mean, for ABC, you know, I know Paul, you know, my brother had it been a big hit, but it wasn't original enough, and and the audience senses that, and they there's enough of the other that they don't have to buy into it. So I mean, that show's not doing well, you know. And now there's this um, this legal battle with CBS and ABC, and, you know, and. I haven't, you know, no one's seen Glass House, so I don't know what it is, but, I mean, hopefully it's substantially different than Big Brother, because if it's not, well then, you know, I don't know if it's illegal to put it on the air, but it certainly lacks uh, imagination and creativity, and, I, 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 and uh, so hopefully that show has its own, you know, uh, energy and its own concept, so that it has a chance of surviving, if it doesn't, the viewers will probably reject it. But Mike, you're, you're one of the most prolific, successful reality TV producers ever, so isn't it kind of, uh, isn't it down to you to kind of come up and do it, didn't you want to? <laughs> <laughs> no uh, I, I try, it's hard, man. Because, <laughs> like, I wouldn't want to do a show that looked and smelled just like another show, so you, you really have to force yourself to think hard about what's like, what hasn't been seen, what hasn't been done. Um, particularly for network, because on cable, there's there's a little, and I haven't really done much cable at all, like one, two or three series, but there's a luxury there where if your show fails, nobody really notices. You know, I mean, the, the network, the person you're doing it for notices, and they're unhappy, <laughs> but like they don't write about it in USA Today, you know. Um, but then if we can do primetime broadcast television, network TV, fuck, it's, it's terrible when you have a show fail. So I don't want to put a show on the air unless I think it has a chance to really succeed. Therefore, it has to be original. And it has to have some shock value. So I think I have one idea now. And yeah, you're, you're, I'm sure you're happy to yes, share it. It's called, no, I can't tell you. What it is. <laughs> but it's taken me, I mean, I haven't really pitched uh, an, an original network television show that I believed in in a couple years because it's it's really fucking hard now, you know. Can we, we can't tell us the name of the show, but can we even kind of get a sense of uh, <laughs> in what area it might be in or something? Can, can you give us a clue? What's it's got it? a little bit of hybrid in it. And uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it'll, hopefully it'll be scary. Hybrid of what? I can't say anything. I got one of those people here. My show, my company's part of 
world of others. Yeah, I mean, did, what you're saying about there being perhaps, will cable be the kind of the, the testing ground for the more experimental, the more out there ideas? Because, you know, as you alluded to, it's not the same. They're still in well, I, think they have not as I, think they, I think they've done a good job with that. I think cable, you know, I, I think cable's taking more chances, you know, and I think they've done, you know, interesting stuff. I, I, you know, I think the cable business uh, is is more vibrant than the network alternative businesses right now. And TV is also a very international business nowadays, and The Bachelor has been, the original is on air all over, and there are local versions. Do you, do you kind of invest time in those? Can you do that? I mean, we, it's funny when we're upstairs and people are saying, asking you about the Canadian Bachelor, but you get that wherever you, you get it. Right? Well, we just did a whole symposium in London uh, a few months back, which was awesome. And was all <laughs> the fans. No, 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 no. The, uh, the producers of all the, oh, the, the, the bachelors in various countries. and. Man, they told me stories that were just crazy. Like, I, don't, I don't remember if it was the Romanian or the Russian version, or the, oh, the, yeah. at the very end, the girl says she's not in love with the doctor, but she was in love with the director of the show. Oh. He comes running down from the control room and sweeps her up into his arms. And like, oh, that's so good. I mean, you're doing a lot of other stuff. Aside from reality, you've got an incredible track record with reality, but I know you're doing movies, some horror movies, and you're doing documentaries. Is, is there any, can you kind of join the dots and connect? Is there a thread that goes through all of these, or are these just kind of separate areas of interest? Well, the documentary stuff is related, because I, I mean, I, I love nonfiction. I mean, I watch a lot of documentaries, I read a lot of nonfiction uh, books, and, and, you know, I mean, I, documentary is what sort of has spawned the whole reality TV business in the first place. So I think you're able to tell fairly powerful stories, you know, with that medium. I, I, I mean, I just watched uh, a couple weeks ago the, the, the Marley documentary, Kevin McDonald. He worked 10 years on that thing, and it was, it's, it's, it's masterful. It's just, it's a beautiful piece of work. I encourage everybody to watch it. I mean, it's just, it's beautiful. He makes so many smart storytelling decisions, and. And so I, I love that stuff. So I mean, I I feel I feel there's a connection between documentary and uh, and reality. I, I made a movie about Ozzy Osbourne last year called God Bless Ozzy Osbourne that comes on Showtime next month, and that, I was I'm very proud of that. And now I'm working on a, on a, a documentary about the Grateful Dead uh, from the perspective of Bob Weir, and, uh, and that's fun for me. Um, because real life stories are amazing, and that's why reality TV, when it really works, is amazing. Because you're looking into people's real lives, you know, and, uh, and you can't write that stuff. It's, it's unpredictable, and I think that's why the audience responds to it when it's done right. So, documentaries, the new reality. Yeah, it's like what's <laughs> old is new, or new is old, whatever that's the thing. It's just, <laughs> Um, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. <coughs> see. Question? Yeah, we've got one just a few rows back. I don't know if mic, the mic's coming down. Okay. Uh, oh, were you worried about breaking the brand of the Bachelor Bachelorette by having Emily as the Bachelorette being a single mother? Because I found a lot of people were, fans were almost upset because she wasn't like the other Bachelor Bachelorettes. Well, that's interesting. I hadn't considered that because uh, uh, Jason Mesnick was a single dad. But the kid wasn't part of it, and this is so much part of it, like the Miss Peggy show and all that kind of stuff that was in it. And we moving. thought that would be a strength. Hmm? You know, we thought that would be a real strength because we thought, and I think to some extent we're we're right about it that people would care about Emily's journey more because uh, the stakes were higher. It wasn't just about her. About her and her little daughter. So, I mean, we, it was never a negative to us. You know, we, 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 we always saw little Ricky as a positive for the show. But, you know, and we'll see when the, when the show finishes up and we see what our season average is, whether or not that was a good bet or not. Right now, we're right about level with the other seasons. Uh -huh.
Have you ever had uh, your crew get involved with any of the uh, contestants? Oh, yeah. <laughs> not, uh, not to the extent of the Romanian or the Russian. Uh, but, but a couple seasons ago on uh, Jake Pavelka's season, which was subtitled On the Wings of Love. But we had a producer have an affair with one of the girls on the show before we started taping. And, and, and uh, he. Uh, about two days into taping, he came into our office and, and con made a teary-eyed confession. I don't know if anyone has ever seen that movie, Election. Uh, it was that, like that scene, we're in love, but, but they were really in love. <laughs> that was and that, that relationship cost him his job, and cost the girl her spot on the show, and ended up fizzling out about three weeks later. But it was good for ratings. Yeah. Very good. Thanks. Hi, Mike. Uh, at the conference here, I attended a MasterCard class a few days ago. We talked about a casting for reality mm -hmm. show where they actually use uh, psychological tests like the yeah. MMPI 2. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about, like, do, do you use that on, yeah. for example, Bachelor and uh, the, the ladies? And yeah, we do. How, what, what, what extent? Yeah. We do, and we're really careful about who we let on the show. I mean, I mean, we lose a lot of great potential characters because we're so we're so we're so tough and, and stringent on, on on background checks and psychological profiles. Anyone who's got any sort of borderline personality disorder or instability or the, any sort of past involving even you know contemplation of suicide, we just we just can't take the risk. You know, we just don't. But that's not the case with a lot of the, of the other reality shows. They, they, they go loose, you know. I think that's why, you know, a few years ago when uh, VH1 was doing all those bachelorish shows with Flavor Flav and Ben Michaels and, I don't know, the Island New York, the girl took a dump on the stairs or whatever she did, I don't know. Um, they had that problem where one of the former contestants it was more than a problem. I mean, it was big. One of the former contestants like murdered his ex girlfriend or something like that. I mean, they, I mean it's nasty. And I'm sure they didn't do just the same amount of background and, and, and psychological profiling that we do because that, that had. There had been some evidence of that. Yeah. But did you uh, pick the girls to conflict with each other or like have different personality type mm -hmm. just so that the show is going to be more interesting? Yeah, we try to create a cross section of personality types. You know, we don't want all sort of Bible thumping mm -hmm. girls from the South, and we don't want all sort of sassy girls from New York, and we don't all want sort of airhead, you know, blind bimbos from uh, Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're, you're making a new movie, you did um, you worked in the hostel movies, Texas Chainsaw, and it's a new horror movie in the works, you talked about the Grateful Dead documentary. In terms of new projects, are you more passionate about the factual and the scripted stuff than, than the new reality, given the lay of the land? I guess it depends on what the new reality is that we're talking about. Right? Right now, I can honestly say I'm not, I don't wish I was producing any of the reality shows that are currently on another TV. I'm not like, I remember when Survivor came on, and I was like, wow, that's a fucking great idea. I wish I had thought of that. I, I wish I was part of that. And hats off to my friend Mark Burnett, he's amazing. And uh, that was a great, great thing. But now the shows, I, I would, you know, I'd rather not. Would you ever, would you ever consider doing straight up? scripted, you know, drama for TV. Yeah, I would like to do that. I mean, it's a hard game to play, too. I mean, it's so many scripts get written, and you, know, you get to make, become pilots, and then only a few of those pilots get to become television shows. So, you know, I, I, I'm going to try to do that. I'm developing something with my friend Owen Wilson right now, and uh, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a one hour drama. It's pretty good. And so, I'm going to take a shot with that. What was it about, Mike? It's, uh, <laughs> it's set in a tropical paradise. Mm -hmm. yeah.
good stuff. Um, that, that was just a really, a really great hour. I know we kind of covered lots of ground. Um, great to hear about the Bachelor, new stuff you're working on, thoughts on the industry. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much.